Good evening. Just a couple of operational matters. If you would kindly silence your cell phone, and I will do the same. Um, if you're interested in earning uh, AIA HSW uh, CEUs, feel free to sign in the sheet that Jure has at the front desk at the entrance to the cast hall. All right. Um, ben, come on forward. Me? Yeah, you. All right. Good evening. Welcome to the highlight of the spring lecture series, the Cacheri Lecture in the Humanities, given by professor, writer, thinker, maker, architect, Mabel Olivia Wilson. My name is Karen Nelson, and I'm dean of the School of Architecture at the BAC. For those of you who are new to the Boston Architectural College, we offer undergraduate and graduate degrees in landscape architecture, architecture, interior architecture and design studies. This college was founded in 1889 as a place of conversation. And we continue to try to bring new energy to the conversation about design and the city. Tonight, we're here to celebrate the life and work of Dean Arcangelo Cacheri through this lecture in the humanities. We do this in part because of the volunteer work of the Dean from 1943 until 1995 who challenged us to raise questions about the role that design plays in society. The lectureship began as a 90th birthday gift to Archangelo, which he gave back to the students. The celebration took place in this very room just 27 years ago. I want to express my gratitude to BAC community members, especially Bernie Goba, Don Brown, Russ Feldman, and Anthony Pina, who have been instrumental in keeping this lectureship alive in the life of the college all these years. Thank you for your energy and commitment. Each year, the BAC invites a distinguished speaker to present a public lecture on the many ways in which architecture and design interact with other disciplines and enrich our common life. This year's 27th Cachere Lecture in the Humanities is Professor Mabel Wilson. Professor Wilson is an accomplished architect and educator who teaches architectural design and history theory courses at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. She is also a senior fellow at the Institute for Research in African American Studies and co-directs the Global Africa Lab. Her design and scholarly research investigates space, politics, and cultural memory in black America, race and modern architecture, new technologies and the social production of space, and visual culture in contemporary art, film, and new media. Her transdisciplinary practice, Studio And, for all the things that architecture as a collaborative practice joins, and for what it has also avoided. Professor Wilson has been a competition finalist for several important cultural institutions, including Lower Manhattan's African Burial Ground Memorial and the Smithsonian's National Museum for African American History and Culture, with Diller Scafidi on Renfro. Exhibits of her work have been featured at the Wexner Center for the Arts, the Cooper Hewitt, the Storefront for Art and Architecture, SF Camera Works. She's a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, that's WBYA, an advocacy project to educate the architectural profession about the problems of globalization and labor. In her work with Who Builds Your Architecture, she makes a compelling case for rethinking global networks that connect architects to migrant workers and moving toward a lead-like standard for treating workers with care and dignity. Professor Wilson takes the awkward and unmanageable in globalization and creates potent places of possibility. WBYA's work was featured in the 2014 Istanbul Design Biennale in 2011, she was honored as a US Artist Ford Fellow in Architecture and Design. 
She is the author of Negro Building, Black Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums in 2012. Her scholarly essays have appeared in numerous journals and books on critical geography, memory studies, art, and architecture. She has received awards, fellowships, and residencies from the Getty Research Institute, the New York State Council for the Arts, ID Magazine, and for 2015-16, she was the Alsa Mellon Bruce Senior Fellow at the National Gallery of Art Center for Advanced Study in Visual Arts. She's currently developing the manuscript Building Race and Nation, How Slavery Influenced Antebellum American Civic Architecture, and collaborating on a collection of essays on race and modern architecture. Professor Wilson received her Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Virginia, her Master of Architecture from Columbia University, and her PhD in American Studies from New York University. Please give your full attention and a warm welcome to Mabel O. Wilson for her cashier lecture entitled, Memory, Race, Nation, The Politics of Modern Memorials. Great. Thank you, Karen, for that really generous and thoughtful um, introduction. I want to thank Jenna Atchison um, for all of her hard work and getting me here uh, today. And also to say, everyone, it, it's indeed an honor to be here and be the Kasheri um, uh, uh, lecture um, today. Uh, and it's interesting because it's a question of the humanities, right, and that relationship of the humanities within architecture. And that's what I appreciate the most about architecture, which is in part why my practice is called Studio And, because it's and everything. Um, but architecture is such an interdisciplinary um, field, um, and, and really I think it engages the inner polymath in us all who are here. Um, and certainly I feel like I've had professional ADHD, so <laughs> there you go, it's perfect. Um, so I wanted to say the, the talk that I'm going to give tonight is somewhat of a work in progress. Um, and uh, it's connected on one hand to a scholarly deep archival work I'm doing called Building Race and Nation that looks at slavery and uh, Native American dispossessions impact on American civic architecture. So when Michelle Obama said, I wake up in a house built by slaves, like how is that possible? Um, but it's also connected with an amazing project I've been working on for the last almost two and a half years now with um, Eric Howler, Mi Jin Yoon, um, part of our teams here today, um, and with a great team in Charlottesville as well, uh, and an artist in, in Brooklyn, New York, at Otatigbe, on, on the memorial to enslaved laborers at UVA. I'm also a graduate, <laughs> undergraduate of UVA. So in a way, it's sort of exercising my undergraduate demons, but also to think about a critical project in the sense that Jefferson really is the intersection of, of politics, of sciences. He was a natural historian and, and, and scientist. Um, architecture, clearly, uh, but also he was a plantation holder um, and very, very complex uh, individual, to say the least. So, um, so my talk will narrate a recent incident that brings together um, the explosive tension between monuments and monumental architecture, political protest, and certain racial claims. So how do race, place, memory intersect? Um, in my talk, I will ruminate, and this is the theoretical part, and sorry I want to slog through this because I think it's useful, um, on how historian theorist Michel Foucault's notion of biopower um, is useful as a springboard to ask how race, the racial racism organizes many facets of modern social life to do both their discursive work of ideas and language, but also the material work, right? The physical world in which we live in, which the exhibition downstairs shows us how redlining, right, will produce a physical artifact in the city uh, that is segregated. So the material work in the public and monumental spaces of the nation from its founding to current day. And then I'll return to the original locale to consider in the disposition of a national monument when its racialized social and material, co material contours come to light. TJ is a racist and a rapist. Read the sign, read the sign three protesters propped up against the shrouded statue of Thomas Jefferson at the University of Virginia, I uh, will we'll refer to as UVA, um, in Charlottesville. On September 13th, um, uh, 2017, dozens of protesters, oops, 
disaster. Great. Uh, dozens of protesters, a group that included students, faculty, and residents, engaged in an act of civil disobedience by wrapping the figure of Jefferson in black plastic and draping a Black Lives Matter, Fuck White Supremacy banner at the statue's marble base. What the protesters demanded was for the university's administration to renounce the institution's historical connections with racist individuals and groups by, for example, removing two Confederate memorial plaques affixed to the rotunda South interests. Um, this was, in fact, a march to reclaim our grounds. That's what it was called. The demonstration uh, proclaimed solidarity with local residents in response to the violent and deadly white nationalist uh, march that took place one month earlier and left one anti-racist uh, counter-protester, Heather Heyer, dead. Members of the white nationalist groups had descended on Charlottesville to protest the city's government proposed removal of monuments to Confederate generals Robert E. Lee and Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. On the first night of their rampage, of a, a group of 100 mostly white men led a torch-lit parade through the university's historic grounds, an ominous reenactment of Ku Klux Klan night marches. While alternating cries of, you will not replace us, and Jews will not replace us, and white lives matter, the throngs of white nationalists encircled a smaller group of anti-racist protesters at the base of the Jefferson statue. Jefferson, who in his lifetime had been a vociferous champion of freedom for white Euro-Americans, but had also lacked the political and personal will to end chattel slavery, which would have freed thousands of enslaved blacks, including hundreds of his own slaves, became a flashpoint for both the condemnation and exaltation of the white nationalist ideals constitutive to the nation's founding and prosperity. Now, the incident raises several questions about why monuments in the U.S. South have become flashpoints for a retrenchment of fervent white supremacy in the age of Donald Trump, but also why they've been sites of contestation that advocate for the removal of monuments. This struggle, played out on college campuses, in front of courthouses, and in the media, has exposed the fissures and fault lines of the U.S.'s white nationalist underpinnings that have been papered over by the boosterism proselytizing American exceptionalism. Racism, racism isn't limited to a personal prejudice that one has towards someone else. Race is historical, race is structural. It operates in tandem with other modern formations that are social, political, physical, and discursive. I like the term by scholar Alex Wahaley of racial assemblages that he argues are the outcomes of these historical processes of racialization. We can think of racial assemblages as, quote, ongoing sets of political relations that require through a constant perpetuation via institutions and discourses, practices, desires, infrastructures, languages, technologies, sciences, economies, dreams, and cultural artifacts the barring of non-white subjects from the category of the human is performed in the modern West. And I think that's very important. Like this notion of humanness is what links us all together, but that gets complicated with the rise of the concept of racial difference. Architecture, its discourses and practices and allied modern disciplines of the built environments are entangled in racial assemblages. Therefore, I want us to think together about how we unpack the legacies of dehumanization that have been the deadly con consequences of the invention of racial difference in order to ask how monuments, their formal tactics of figuration, identification, and historicization reinforce, but also territorialize, the power of these racial histories. So in other words, in order to challenge racial histories, we also need to trace a history of race, keeping in mind all the while that one has to only read Hegel's philosophy of history, in particular the introductory um, chapter called Geographic Basis of History, to recognize that the concept of history is always already racialized, and in the end, racist. <laughs> 
Hegel, for example, writes of Africa, quote, history is in fact out of the question. Life there consists of a succession of contingent happenings and surprises. Make live, let die. The blueprint for the biopolitics of the US social order has always meant that white subjects, idealized in the bronze figure of Jefferson's robust physique, have thrived at the expense of the lives and labor of black and brown bodies. Historian and theorist, Michel Foucault formulated the modern racial state's power dynamic as one, quote, to make live and to let die, end quote. Foucault contrasted this modern state power with the prior configuration in Europe of the right of sovereignty, a divine right whose power in the hands of the monarch or of the church exercised, quote, the right to take life or to let live. So there was a different granting of life and life's possibilities. This right to life and to kill continued with the secular conceptualization of the social contract. What can be best defined as a set of agreed upon legal, political, and social rules that govern members of an enlightened modern society. This is particularly within Europe. European philosophs such as John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Immanuel Kant, and others, and I would include within that, of course, Thomas Jefferson, conceptualized new social orders, new arrangements that enabled groups of Europeans to self-govern, govern. government by the people and for the people. They reformulated the workings of power, one that invested the authority in the liberal subject, rather than the all-knowing God or the supreme monarch, to imagine forms of democratic governance that guaranteed the rights of individual freedom and personal property. Ideally, these rationalized social relations, stewarded by one's peers, legislated and adjudicated how the state's resources, land, food, rights, should be awarded, how they should be allocated or denied. In the rise of liberalism, Foucault's critical historical gaze saw new techniques of power centered on the body, on the individual body. Individuation, quote, one of power's first effects, quote, uh, observed Foucault, became the basis for how a disciplinary society and its institutions, and we think of this with Foucault and he writes about the panopticon, so it's the prison, but he also writes about the school, he writes about the hospital, created compliant, docile bodies capable of being controlled in modern society. So the project was to individuate, to give agency to the individual. That is the, that is the modern project. That is what emerges from the social contract. But alongside this disciplinary power, interpenetrating it, was another technology of power, biopower, which for Foucault relied upon, quote, forecast, statistical estimates, and overall measures, end quote and operated at the scale of the population rather than the individual. Through biopower, the modern state became the arbiter of what conditions could be made for life to flourish or which conditions allowed for life to deteriorate or even die out. One could say that these environmental factors were intentionally created, were by design of the state, in this new social order, not all bodies were made equal. Not all mo modern subjects benefited in, all, in the same measure from the state's beneficence, even though the basis of liberty was that, quote, all men are born equal, as the Declaration of Independence boldly stated. So what does this tell us about monuments and racial history? In his lectures collected under the title, Society Must Be Defended, where he worked through the theorization of biopower, Foucault also traced a genealogy of race and power. That was part of the, the major impetus in this book, was to, to trace a, that genealogy of race within Europe. Importantly, 
Foucault located the origins of race and then racism within the historical development of European nationalism, noting, quote, what we see as a polarity, as a binary rift in society, is not a clash between two distinct races. It is the splitting of a single race into a super race and a sub race, quote. However, scholars such as Alex Wahelyi have cogently argued that Foucault places race as a primitive social rift latent in modernity, one that emerges fully formed in the state-sponsored racism of the 19th century and finally becoming fully operated in the lethal state racism implemented by the Nazis. By severing the rise of the modern state, of rise of modern state racism from its origins in Europe's colonial project, Foucault fails to historicize the formation and influence of, for example, the transatlantic slave trade, which contributed to, how, to, contributed to the grammar for how race differentiated the characteristics of superior white masters from those biologically inferior black slaves, indigenous savages, and dutiful Indian servants, but also making a distinction from those wretched Irish peasants social degenerates, and so forth. So racial differentiation isn't just going on within the colonies, Asia and Africa, and now the New World, but also there's a kind of logic of its working out occurring in Europe, particularly one can see this in the ways in which um, um, England invaded Scot uh, Ireland, for example, uh, which were the sites of the first plantations. That was actually England's first colonial project. So by severing the rise of the modern state racism from its origins in Euro European, Europe's colonial project, Foucault fails to historicize the formation, oh, sorry, um, rendered, rendered by science, history, and culture as subhuman, these inferior races, what Denise de Silva has labeled Europe's others, were rationalized exploitable, as exploitable for their land and labor. And, and, and I do mean that particularly within the Irish context, to enclose the land and also uh, turn the feudal system into a, a system where, where people had to sell, sell their labor. So the operative nature of biopower, I want to argue, opened thresholds of inequality that rationalize the diminished material conditions of daily life. So here we now find the emergence of poverty, violence, death, experienced by racialized Europe's others. That divide between make live and let die, I would propose, defined W.E.B. Du Bois's color line at the start of the 20th century. That line separating make live and let die demarcated um, theorist Sylvia Winter's dominions of man, capital M the universalized European ideal of the human from its archipelago of otherness. As Winter has written, that archipelago of otherness was first populated by, quote, the politically condemned, the interned mad, the interned Indian, the enslaved Negro, end quote. In, in the latter 20th century and beyond the archipelago of otherness, um, this has sheltered be, uh, be, and beyond. The archipelago of otherness has now, and these are 20th and I would say 21st centuries, uh, archipelagos of otherness, quote, the jobless, the homeless, the poor, the systemically made jobless and criminalized of the underdeveloped, all as a category of the economically damned, end quote. So Europe's others eke down an existence as the not modern, the not rational, not free, not white, not citizen, and not human. So as a technology, biopower managed 18th, 19th, and 20th century populations who lived and worked in these public and private domains. And these are, one could think of housing, institutions, commerce, and urban spaces. The state invented ways to regulate this new architecture and urbanism whose systems and networks were much, much larger in scale than the enclosures of disciplinary power. The hospital, the school, the prison, which operate at the scale of the building. So if we rework and expand Foucault's Eurocentric genealogy of race and power, we can discern how the modern state's regulatory and administrative structure 
also evolved from how metropoles like London or Liverpool, Paris, Nantes, Amsterdam, uh, and I would add New York and Boston, managed its colonial housing. And New York and Boston are interesting because they were colonial sites that then become metropoles in and of themselves. And it's also important to consider how they developed new techniques to subjugate indigenous, enslaved, and colonial colonized populations um, and new technologies of war and extraction to claim more land and raw materials. Various tribes in Africa forced into slavery were carried to the New World, for example, because of their knowledge of cultivating things like tobacco, rice, indigo, and other crops. To rationalize their violent subjection and ruthless conquest, white Europeans imagined they possessed superior intellect, morals, and physiques in comparison to those deemed racially inferior. The colonial apparatus was insatiable in its quest for additional human and material resources in order to build the great fortunes of the elite and mercantile class and accumulate more powers of the ruling class. This was how empire formed. From Europe's 600-year-long project of empire building, concepts of racial difference emerged from the sites and networks spawned by these colonial encounters. To be sure, it was Europe's merchants, monarchs, prime ministers, traders, missionaries, planters, bankers, boat builders, rope makers, blacksmiths, engineers, and architects who constituted the apparatus of the transatlantic slave trade. Across three continents, the trade's transactional networks connected through depots, jails, ports, warehouses, auction houses, plantation, banks, custom houses, auctions, stores, and great houses. The resources and wealth gleaned from these colonial routes of trade in human flesh, raw materials, and finished products allowed white Europeans, which eventually included the working classes by the 20th century, to thrive under industrial capitalist expansion. While the denial of resources and theft of wealth incrementally killed black and brown people, peoples in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So if we graft colonialism into Foucault's genealogy of race and biopower, we can discern how the state administers construction of environments that house society, not just in the metropole, but also in the colony and also the post-colony. But more significant, we can analyze public spaces for how they become sites for the symbolic markings of these racialized histories. And I think it's interesting, um, the slide I find fascinating, it's from a bank in the 1930s, but if you look very closely at the bas relief, right, at the threshold, you still see an acknowledgement, right, of the legacy of the slave trade that really built Liverpool's wealth. So to return to the United States racialized landscapes from its conception, inception as a nation in the 18th century, White Americans have deployed monuments to territorialize whiteness through representations of ideal character, physiques, and historical significance. The proliferation of Confederate monuments to a fictive lost cause encapsulates this practice par excellence. These symbolic expressions of white supremacy in monuments, which in towns like Charlottesville, Virginia, demarcated where black residents under Jim Crow's prohibitions could or could not venture the legacy of Virginia's slave codes. These worked in concert with the racial assemblages of urban space, substandard housing, segregated public amenities. There was a really great article actually in the New York Times about Charlottesville's segregated public school system. Racial violence and law enforcement to diminish the prospects of black life. The memorial landscape of Charlottesville provides fertile ground to consider this racialized dynamic. Mr. Jefferson's University. A statesman and slave owner, Jefferson founded the public university near his home, Monticello, in 1817 to promote education as the foundation for the preservation of freedom in the US. 
cast in bronze, cast in an ornamental, uh, cast in bronze in an ornamental Beaux Arts style, and extolled in 1911, the life-size statue of Jefferson by sculptor Moses Ezekiel portrays him at an age, at age 33, with his hands unrolling the text of the Declaration of Independence. And I'm sorry, I did not mean for the slide on the right to actually be there. So imagine that's not there, but I'm really talking about the image on the left. The likeness of the founding father stands firmly atop a replica of the Liberty Bell, encrusted with the muses of liberty, equality, justice, and the brotherhood of man. It stands as a symbol of civic virtue within the plaza on the north facade of Jefferson's neoclassical rotunda. The stature, statue captures Jefferson's character as boldly defiant of the British crown's tyranny and steadfastly upholding the Enlightenment's precept of man's right to freedom. By shrouding the monument, what the Black Lives Matter protesters aimed to redefine was the historical narrative of a founder of the university and the nation as a defender of liberty by pointing to Jefferson's tacit acceptance and practice of dehumanizing bondage. The placard proclaiming Black Lives Matter asserted the value and humanity of black life, quantities, qualities that anti-black racism has historically diminished and eliminated or let die. Now, one key category of racial dehumanization was the aesthetic, which made visible and legible the most desirable visage of the ideal human, man. Enlightenment natural historians and philosophers, including those interested in art and architecture, drew on ancient classicism as a means of validating the origins of European humanism and emerging ideas of republicanism. In the formation of the United States civic sphere, the aesthetics of neoclassicism in architecture, spearheaded by Jefferson the architect, served as a national primer on good civic architecture and public space. We can see the emergence of aesthetics of the public sphere in the Virginia State House, designed by Jefferson, which also served as a model for the US Capitol in Washington, DC. Projects that Jefferson also stewarded. In a letter written to his friend James Madison in 1785, this is while Jefferson was uh, the ambassador to, to, to France. He was in Paris at this time. Jefferson expressed his desire that Virginia's new Capitol building would become a model of architecture worth emulating throughout the new nation. Jefferson writes, quote, how is a taste in this beautiful art to be formed in our countrymen? Unless we avail ourselves of every occasion when public buildings are to be erected, of presenting to them models for their study and imitation. The Capitol building completed in 1788 and sited um, on uh, Shaco Hill in Richmond was modeled in part on the Maison Carré, a third century Roman temple in Nîmes, uh, a first century Roman, uh, Roman temple in Nîmes, France, um, uh, that Jefferson greatly admired. His proposed designs for the Virginia State House which housed the state's legislative and judicial functions, would offer an invaluable public lesson on how architecture could represent the virtues of durability, utility, and beauty. Um, in fact, I mean, Jefferson at some point in his notes on the state of Virginia basically said the architecture in, in the Americas was a bar bar barbaric. So he kind of saw architecture as part of the civilizing process um, of his, his now fellow countrymen. Jefferson hoped that the new Capitol building would be a transformative exercise that would seed a new culture and society in the new world, yielding a fecund white American civilization. Now, the Virginia Assembly voted to place a statue of General George Washington, a celebrated leader of the Continental Army and former member of the House of Burgess and also vaunted member of the slave-holding planter class at the, at the center of their new civic chambers. To aid his fellow Virginians, Jefferson secured the talents of Jean-Antoine Houdon, a well-known French sculptor. In 
Udon traveled to Washington's plantation on the Potomac, Mount Vernon, to, to make a plaster cast of the general's face and measure his physique in order to ensure a faithful physiognomic likeness crafted with the precision of a naturalist. And so I love this Edward Savage um, painting. It's Washington, his wife, obviously, uh, his two step grandchildren and his slave, Henry Lee. Um, and Lee's figure, it's interesting because this is, it gets reproduced in a number, Courier and Ives, and at some point Lee just disappears and it's a complete domestic scene, uh, which is interesting. Um, but Lee's gesture of having his hand in a waistcoat was a sign of gentility. So there's a complex kind of narrative going on here about, um, a, a, about representation um, within, the, within the country. So Udon's life-size Carrera marble carving of Washington, completed in 1791, merged allegorical classical symbols, like the fasces he leans on, with the modern elements such as his military uniform, cane, and plow. The latter situates civic authority in relationship to the land. Washington's classical physique, placed within the central hall of Jefferson's ideal Basilica of Democratic Deliberation, this is within the Virginia State House, marked public space with robust tripart image of white masculinity, farmer, soldier, civic leader. It was a model of American civic virtue that Jefferson hoped would be emulated by yeoman farmers, the white colonial settlers who had pushed the nation's westward boundaries to overtake indigenous populations, and also by the class of civic leaders who would be educated at his university in the Piedmont region of Virginia. Now Jefferson, like many other slave owners, was wholly dependent upon his investment in enslaved labor in their distribution to work his vast plantation holdings, and in the intimate domestic routines performed to sustain his and his family's life. At his plantation Monticello um, uh, and his other properties, Jefferson owned up to 200 slaves at one time, more than 600 over his lifetime. But Jefferson held what he described as moral, physical and moral, objections to the Negro based on a lifetime of observations to their comportment and character. Because universal uh, uh, reason relied upon experimentation and observation for the validation of truth, Jefferson's conceptualization of the racial paradigm of human difference found one promis promising register in skin color, a visual trait evident upon first encounter. Some would call this phenotype. phenotype. Uh, is a scientific term. What scholar Sandra Gilman characterizes as blackness developed, quote, a specific connotation in white society. It is an, the exterior sign through which the European rationalizes the inferiority of the black and permits his exploitation in the slave trade, end quote. The overall lack of beauty in blackness visually and viscerally appalled Jefferson. He rationalized what counted as beautiful could be applied to the breeding of animals and therefore also to the human species, where variations in, in the, the physical nature of the human, hair texture and skin color were visible. Out of all of these markers, skin color was the most obvious indicator of racial difference. The origins of the skin's coloration for Jefferson, however, could not be discerned by dissection of the epidermal layers or through a chemical analysis of blood or bile. He determined skin color as, quote, fixed in nature, and it is therefore of a divine causation. The aesthetics of blackness, the state of being black, informed the rationalization of the variations in the human species that divided peoples living on the continents of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and the Americas, and affirmed the superiority of Europeans in their whiteness. Now, under Jefferson's probing imperial gazes within the pages of Notes on the State of Virginia, which he publishes in 1785, this also while he's in Paris, Features, the black bodies, features of the black bodies were seen as less beautiful in comparison to the symmetry and flowing hair of the white body. He verified this by suggesting that even Native Americans found whites preferable in much the same way as, quote, the preference of the orangutan for the black woman over those of his own species, end quote. That is Jefferson. 
This degrading theory that when rendered black women as subhuman closer to primates was based on a polygeny polygenesis that, that had circulated earlier in Edward Long's epic um, history of Jamaica. Blackness signified the Negro's subhumanity and validated her ruthless exploitation. The Negro's inability to appreciate beauty, except in the most sensual manner, sensual manner, or to create works of true aesthetic value, except out of mimicry, also provided Jefferson with, with additional evidence of their natural mental inferiority. In query 14 of Notes on a State of Virginia, Jefferson surmised that in their ability to remember, blacks were equal to whites, but in their ability to reason and to comprehend things like mathematics and sciences, they were certainly inferior. Jefferson condemned blacks who, quote, in their imagination, were dull, tasteless, and anomalous. Unquote. So it is what he would say as the um, unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty, unquote. Um, Jefferson could then rationalize that this is, quote, a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people, end quote. Jefferson's rumination on the moral and physical inferiority of the enslaved was critical for how he elevated and rationalized white superiority and mastery. And the words of scholar Cydia Hartman, quote, the long-standing and intimate affiliation of liberty and bondage made it possible to envision freedom independent of constraint or personhood and autonomy separated from the sanctity of property and proprietal notions of the self. Moreover, since the dominion and domination of slavery were fundamentally defined by black subjection, race appositely framed questions of sovereignty, right, and power." End quote. So these things are intricately bound. To understand freedom, one has to, has to posit slavery. So that double bind of the intimate affiliation of liberty and bondage was central to neo, the neoclassical designs of Jefferson's UVA. You have 10 pavilions to house faculty and family, rooms to board 125 male students, the verdant swath of the terrace lawn, and then you have the rotunda, the centerpiece of this ensemble, housing the library, it's a monument to the Enlightenment. So in his plans, uh, and these are the various uh, pavilions, so these would sort of educate this class of students on, on aesthetics and the importance of good architecture. These are examples of pavilions three and four. So in his plans for the academical village, is what he termed it, in the foothills of the Piedmont, Jefferson brought together an exclusive community and an environment conducive, as he would write, to health, to study, to manners, morals, and order, end quote. But what until recently remained silent in the official narratives about the university's antebellum period from 1817 to 1865 was mention of the village's dependency on an equal number of enslaved men, women, and children who built, worked, and lived at the university. Um, so this is one of the, this is actually a cartouche from a well-known map. Um, and you could see the pavilions, the students, right, and this beautiful terraced um, lawn, which had a spectacular view, basically, um, out, out to the landscape, a kind of sublime sort of condition of the problem, of, of uh, the promise of the nation. So thus, while in Jefferson's educational Eden, its white residents embarked on a daily journey of personal enlightenment and communal engagement, whose material needs were satisfied by the labor of slaves. For the enslaved, their daily routine unfolded under the regulatory authority of slave codes that severely curtailed mobility and rights. In the designs for UVA, Jefferson carefully calibrated vistas throughout the grounds to strategically hide from um, view the spaces where slaves labored. Slaves worked in poorly illuminated kitchens and lived 
in quarters below the pavilions on the backside. <coughs> Behind each pavilion, they worked inside the snaking serpentine walls where the wash and smoke houses and other dependencies could be found. So they're not the ornamental gardens we see today. The enslaved lived under the constant threat of violence at any time from any white person on or off grounds that ensured unyielding obedience. In 1856, one white male student named Nathan Nolan, for example, brutally, uh, brutally beat an enslaved girl of 10 years old until she fell unconscious and bloody because she challenged his authority to whip her since he did not own her. Disciplined by the university authorities, Nolan was eventually required to apologize to the child's owner, but not the girl whose name remains absent from the university records. So while we can know that on the morning of Monday, July 31st, 1809, at Monticello, Jefferson feasted on a breakfast of, quote, tea, coffee, excellent muffins, hot wheat and cornbread, cold ham and butter, quote, giving him the robust constitution that allowed him to live until the age of 83, to be immortalized in hundreds of statues around the world, we know almost nothing about the slaves who built and lived at his university. It was, after all, mostly the enslaved workers who, built the who did the back-breaking labor of digging the clay, filling the moles, and firing the bricks of an estimated 1.2 million bricks for the rotunda. It is on one of the few original bricks now on view in a vitrine in an exhibition in the basement galleries of the Rotunda where careful viewers can find the thumbprints of an enslaved worker. This pressing of flesh to clay marks the condition of the black body under slavery. For Hortus Spiller, quote, if the body represents legal personhood qua uh, self-possession, then the flesh designates those dimensions of human life cleaved together cleaved by the working together of deprivation and deprivation. In order for this critical ruse to succeed, however, subjects must be transformed into flesh before being granted the illusion of possessing a body." End quote. So unlike the detailed statue of Jefferson, think of how the bronze has been crafted, the handprint leaves a very different symbolic register of the over 5,000 men women, and children who labored and lived in the academical village. These slight indentations, accidental traces of a, light enslaved, of, of, of a life enslaved of flesh have become an improbable memorial. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do I have a question? <laughs> oh, it's it's my question is so um I guess you could say <laughs> so I mean, you, you've spoken about, about architecture and you've spoken about Jefferson and his relationship to slavery. And the, the question that lingers, I think, um, around this is Jefferson's relationship to Sally Hemings and what that means <laughs> and um, why, um, how, how does one reconcile uh, that question? Yeah, both reconcile and reckon with, which I think is what has happened um, uh, at Monticello, which has been very interesting. I, I first went to Monticello when I was an undergrad, went on the tour, no mention, right? And they were servants, right? No slaves, they were servants. Then later, you start to get the history of slaves, and they start doing literally archaeological work in Mulberry Row, which is pretty remarkable. And literally, it's like the excavation of the truth, right? Um, and so for a long time, they're amazing. They've done really amazing work. There's a woman named Lucia Stanton 
who's done a remarkable digging through the archive. I mean, Jefferson was obsessed with leaving traces. He left traces about a lot of things, and there were certain things that were clearly scrubbed. But they were able to sort of find out a fair amount about the enslaved that had lived there. Um, and you know, they started to put together a descendant group that had been claiming for a long time you know, that we are the Seming, uh, descendants of the Hemings. And, uh, and so finally, um, the foundation who runs it really took on the project of you know, uh, flushing out fully Monticello as a plantation, showing where everything was, where people lived and worked. And they think they figured out where Sally Hemings actually lived, which is in the U-shaped um, form that sits below the house, right? Because Jefferson just buries, I mean, he thinks architect, I mean, he was the man of the section, right? He just thinks, he buries things he doesn't want to see, right? Everything is out of view that he finds, again, distasteful. Um, so her room is down below, they believe. Um, and so now when you go, as of July, you go on the house tour and you go on the tour of Mulberry Row. It's all one synthetic narrative, right? And so uh, it's been an interesting sort of reckoning, right? And, and literally reconciling spatially, bringing those two things together. First that's invisible, then it's separated, and now the narrative really, really links it together. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really, but it, it's, you know, he's, it's complicated, you know, and it's complicated. Do people know the story of Sally Hemings? If people don't, yeah, not everybody knows. Um, her mother, Elizabeth Hemings, um, was owned by um, John Wales. John Wales had a daughter, Martha Wales. Martha Wales marries Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Elizabeth Hemings was John Wales' concubine, and he has a number of children, James, um, uh, Esten, Sally, right? So when Martha Wales marries Thomas Jefferson, that entire family passes into the hands, once John Wales dies, into the hands of Thomas Jefferson and his family. So Sally Hemings is Martha Jefferson's half-sister. Uh, and she was um, racially one-quarter black. So, um, yeah, so she was very, she was white, essentially. Uh, and then their kids are one-eighth black, right? Or however you want to look at it. And so it's very complicated. Like, he owned his children. Um, and so, yeah. So that's what I mean, the entanglements and the truths. And, and a lot of it, you know, from my perspective, having read the history and thought, a lot of it's just about denial. It's not even just denial. It's about, well, if other stakes claim, right, as relatives, you got to share the wealth. And this was not unusual. This is very, very common for there to be. Con in my family, there's a, con you know, there's a history of a, con of a concubine, that somebody was the concubine of a, of a slaveholder. Um, so it's not, this is in, in my family, it's in North Carolina. So it's not that uncommon um, if you've been here, which my family has been here for a long, 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 long time. And so it's the entanglements, right? It's the reckonings that you know, Americans on, on all shades have a very difficult time contending with. But it's a, it's a spatial one, because I think Monticello shows you, right, you know, like how do you reconcile those divisions, you know, which are made in the landscape, right? But that landscape, you know, the, the, the show Red Lining Downstairs shows you that that logic continued in terms of you go here, you go here. So that answers. <laughs> and I did go to, to the Beaux-Arts Ball as Sally Hemings when I was an undergrad, so. <laughs> so I've been thinking about this for a long time. I have a, uh, my question is about the nails. I remember in Monticello, mm -hmm. just first I had to get over the shock of my daughter hugging Thomas Jefferson because he was this beautiful bronze statue and she was a little girl and wrapped her arms around him <laughs> for a photo and it, it was like my body split in half <laughs> because he was very beautiful. Um, and then on the other hand, I was thinking of the history, which she knew nothing of. So there's that, that's the first thing. But the second thing was um, the nails, I remember. And um, I would just like to know from, you know, I see the, the thumbprint, but the nails were so significant on, on that tour. I just wanted to hear yeah. you. Yeah, no, he, ran a, he was always in debt, apparently. Um, I mean, I'm not in, I, I, I'm working on Jefferson, but his, just, his archive is just, yeah, it's, it's, it literally is monumental. But he was in debt, he lived well. He liked to live well. He liked fine wines, great art. Um, he was a Francophile. I think of his portrayal in Hamilton, it's like, yeah, that's probably right. Um, but he was constantly in debt. He had to sell off his library to the Library of Congress. Um, 
And so he was, I think he farmed tobacco first, but that wasn't lucrative. And, and the, the tobacco is very intensive and can, can wipe out various soil. So he shifts to wheat, and I forget what else he starts to grow. But he still needs more money, so he starts a nailery, uh, which produces the nails for a lot of his a lot of his properties, but also he sales, sells them. And he runs this nailery, and they're mostly kids, that young, young men who are running boys, essentially running the nailery. Um, and uh, it became a business. And um, yeah, and he would keep in his, in, you know, he was obsessive about logging everything. And he would, he would keep, you know, that you had to, you know, the, the number of nails that were made. And there were often like buckets, you know, that like, a, like a, one person would make like a bucket of nails per day. So it was pretty... Um, relentless labor, um, but that was also the nailery was part of uh, you know part of that whole thing in Mulberry Row. And he even designed he designed a nailery, but that never it never got built in terms of the, the way he imagined it at all. Talk about how one can see the beauty in um, Thomas Jefferson today, as we see his statue, his images, mm -hmm. and when you talk about the classical nature of, that he represented. Because um, I just, the image was beautiful, but yet I kept thinking of the history, and it was both. It was both and. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the reckoning of the, tr the truth. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's what I meant in the beginning of the problem of American exceptionalism. Like, we're just, ex like, our stuff doesn't stink. <laughs> we're these exceptional people. We founded the city, you know, it's Winthrop, right? The city, shining city on a hill, but... No, actually, it's very, very complicated um, history. One, the wiping out of indigenous populations, both by by war, you know, incursion upon land, and then you know, disease. You know, that's a really ruthless, bloody, you know, centuries and centuries long, long history. But also, in order, because there was the project, particularly in Virginia. That's why Virginia is fascinating to study because it was a company that people had shares in, and those who came over, which were often the second, third, fourth sons of the aristocracy, could amass vast tracts of land, 10,000 acres of land that they could not possibly have um, in, in England. Um, and then they needed the labor. There just was not enough labor to migrate over to work the land. And the Crown was saying, well, you can't just have all that land and actually not be productive, because when the land is productive, the crown collects taxes. Goods are actually made. It, it moves an economy. Um, so there was a lot of pressure in the 18th century for, for land to be productive. And they just figured out, well, indentured servitude wasn't quite working because they just could not keep the number of, of, of white indentured labor coming. There were initially black indentured servants. But then the idea of being bonded in perpetuity, which is slavery, you know, it was, it was happening elsewhere in the Barbados and other holdings. It's like, okay, yeah, that works. And so that became, particularly in Virginia, a model for having the pool of labor, particularly around tobacco, which is very, very, very labor intensive. Wheat less so. And, and then you end up with an excess of enslaved labor in Virginia that they incrementally sell westward, right, to, the, to Louisiana, to the larger plantations that are now starting to grow cotton, cotton in the latter part of the 18th century. Um, so that, that question of, of the labor that is to produce the wealth of the country is, is, is intense. But, you know, the remarkable thing, it's not just here. There's a whole network that, um, you know, that, that made wealth off the slave trade all up and down the eastern seaboard, you know. Um, you know, Boston is very much like Liverpool, so is New York City. Uh, and this is the reckoning. This is the thing that we can't reconcile is the degree to which, you know, that was part of how monies were made, and it was just part of the trade uh, that occurs. Um, and so most people think, oh, slavery is like gone. It's in that big plantation somewhere in the 19th century, but it's just, it's part of American history, and that's what needs to be rec reckoned with, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we should have a group of students in here who are currently in a course called Community Practice where we're wrestling with a lot of content uh, related to issues of social equity um, and how we can foresee kind of alternative models for our practice as emerging designers. Um, what's amazing is the recollection of uh, these narratives of labor that you're describing being either omitted or concealed or, or 
wholly erased from the things that we encounter every day in material presence. I'm wondering, um, and given that seems to be a current focus of your work and research, um, if you might have any hopeful insight into how these young emerging professionals might start to think differently or, or engage differently with these practices to be beyond just aware of um, what it means to be a designer, if, you, if there are examples you might give. Mm. <laughs> you mean <laughs> examples of practice? Sure. Um, or things that you find to be hopeful <laughs> about emerging models of well, you know, there was um, yeah, just something. Um, uh, Who Builds Your Architecture is an advocacy project um, that I work on with a collective. Um, and um, one of the members, Lindsay Wickstrom, um, uh, sent an email a couple of days ago about the Serpentine Pavilion that's designed by Ishigami. And it was specifically because there had been a request for people to intern for free. That got out, and it was like, no. <laughs> there was a huge backlash against that, which was really, re really remarkable. You know, that people are now, no, 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 value your labor, right? That's the one thing, right, capitalism asks, forces you to do, is you have to sell your labor on a market. Uh, and you just don't give it away for free. But there's often the conflation. Uh, uh, my, um, the chair of my dissertation, Andrew Ross, wrote a really great book called um, no collar about how artists were engaged in um, the creation of the internet. This is back in the mid to late 90s, right? And the sense that you're a bohemian, you're an artist, you're, this is really cool and fun and creative. And so not positing it as work, right? Uh, which means that you don't see yourself working and you don't see the hours that you put having value. Uh, and, and, you know, so, you know, it's the myth of the bohemian is, is the way he described it. And, and I think that's very true for, for architects as well, right? We're, we're, Scott, we're artists, we're, you know, and not real. no, actually, we have, we're trained to have expertise and that expertise actually has value. Um, and that's difficult. Um, but what's interesting is that when, then when you look at artists who do do that, for example, musicians, like musicians who work on broad, they're in a union, they get paid X, they don't work, you know, I mean, there's a way in which, you know, there's a sense of getting a fair wage for, for your labor. So, and it's complicated in um, a current economies of, um, oh, what do they call it? The, the gig economy, for example, right? So, yeah, so it's, 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 it's complicated. But it's great to see, I, you know, I feel like the generation, because I think the millennials, generation just does not have, the system isn't working for them. They're burdened with debt, they can't afford to buy a house. I mean, it just, it's not there. So they're seeing themselves in other ways and making other demands, which I think they absolutely have to and should. So I think we can learn from them, <laughs> in other words. So I'm curious, um, given our reconciling our history, and we have on the, on the subject of actual monuments, art that have been created, images of Confederate heroes, et cetera. How, how, do you, how do you feel about removing these um, as opposed to, in other words, what direction do you think is probably the healthiest? I think the healthiest thing is to have a conversation. Like, whether it stays or goes has to be up to that community. Like, I think some cases, yeah, it should be go. The other, it should be recontextualized or kept, yeah, and, 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 and so that people can learn. But to be able to have the conversation is, I think, the first and foremost most important thing that people can, to be able to even have so that there isn't shame or anger, but to be able to understand what is this history and why is this here? Um, because it's just those confederate, I don't get it, you lost. Like, how could you build a monument if you lost the war if there wasn't something already in those monuments that were Americans, that weren't Confederate? These are, you know, I feel like they should be called American monuments, not Confederate monuments, right? Because they didn't build them on the Confederacy. They built them, you know, as American citizens. So I should, well, I should write an op-ed. And there <laughs> You're giving me ideas. And, and, as you, and as you've said, it's not just in the Confederacy. It's also Oh, yeah, it's all here. Of, yeah. In New England. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what I mean. It's, it's the complicated legacy. 
you know, but it's the dynamics that ra the, the racial enables, right? There's, there's, that's why I, I love the Foucault, because it's to let live. So lives thrive, right? So life can thrive and reproduce itself, but then there's an, at the benefit, at the, it, but it costs others whose lives cannot reproduce, cannot even live, you know, and that's the dynamic that often gets hit. That's what's separated, right? Right, because you're not living like this. You're on this side of town, and you're living on that side. Where you're living in the bottoms, where the water's polluted, the air's polluted, rent's expensive, housing substandard. You know, I think you know Ta-Nehisi Coates is right. I mean, when Ta-Nehisi says it's plunder, it's like, but there's the constant capitalist exploitation, even of impoverishment. Um, and, and yeah, it's a problem. I mean, I wrote this really interesting piece for Are We Still Human? Is that what I wrote it for? Yeah, it was called Are We Still Human, which was the Istanbul Biennale, uh, curated by Beatrice Colomino and Mark Wigley. And I looked at a jail. It was this jail that Thomas Jefferson had designed. And its drawings were actually in the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I said, like, what is Thomas Jefferson doing with this jail? So I filed it away. But then when I looked closely, you could see that he describes, literally he says, male, female, white debtor, white female debtor, white male debtor. They're in the front. Then on one side is white male criminal, white female criminal. Um, and then on the right side is just black male, black female. So there's not even a recognition of the black subject as in any way lawful, which I thought was incredibly revealing about literally what the space was saying and also what the law rendered. Um, so yeah, so there, there's, you know, I think the landscape definitely tells us things. Huh? Okay. Yeah.